I think that the population in the Sneaky Thigh series um, reflects that, you know, your closest to animals. You obviously live with kind of a menagerie of your own, and you wouldn't write so lovingly about all these cats and dogs and horses. And I do. And the one thing that keeps coming back to me over and over again is, you know, first of all, cats and dogs are little predators, and we're medium-sized predators. And when a predator looks at something straight in the eye, um, they're going to pounce. That's a kill. So predators will often not look one another in the eye. So when your dog or your cat is looking at you right in the eyes, it means they trust you. It means there's mm. tremendous trust. It's the bond. And so uh, knowing that I have this bond and that they feel it for me too, I've paid a lot more attention to them. And one of the things that is, it's really come forcibly home these last couple of years with the rise of the Christian right and, um, and of course, I don't want to get into that too much because I'll get Tourette syndrome. So we know we're going to die. Animals know when they're dying. They know when another animal is dying, and they will often know when a human is sick and perhaps very ill before the human does. Really? So they have these knowledge, but they don't carry around with them the idea that they will die. They know when it occurs. We know, usually by the time we're five, that we can die. So this creates tremendous fear in the human animal and anxiety. And we've created these elaborate belief systems to soften the fear, to deny the inevitable, in essence. Um, animals don't do that. We filter all experience through these ideologies, which means we're missing a lot, and in some cases, just plain wrong. The animals see exactly what is. And having that consciousness in a mystery series is a great gift for a writer because I don't have to pretend. They can say the things that are true that no human would ever say, either because it's, it's too offensive to them or because they can't see it. Or it's too, when you say offensive, you mean it's too fearful? Or they're too fearful? Well, sure. I mean, I mean something as simple as animals call their young. How, 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 could, how could you say to a human, call your young? Ah, okay. You know, call the damaged. We'll spend thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars to save a, a, a little creature that's damaged and ignore 20 that are healthy that could have been sent to college. And we think we're compassionate. Perhaps we are. I'm, I'm not arguing the point. But to an animal, that's ridiculous. Right. Because there are only so many resources. They understand the concept of finite resources. In America, I don't think we do anymore. I think we're so rich and so satiated we just think we can go on forever, that there's no, there's no piper to pay. Well, I also don't think we're reinvesting in ourselves, but that's another whole matter. I've just been in Europe for a while and looking at Spain, where they are obviously spending money on Spain, mm -hmm. you know, to, to do things with their infrastructure and all. And I think if you travel around America, you can see places that are crumbling away, but we're not, we're not reinvesting in all that. I have felt that um, that the Sneaky Pie Mysteries, I've never really thought of them as, as cozies. I don't think of you as, as a cozy person. <laughs> um, have, have not, I don't want to say darkened. I don't think that's really fair, but I certainly thought in Whisker of Evil, the new one, you know, you're dealing with some pretty tough subjects. You know, you're talking about rabies, you're talking about lots of passions, and of course you're always talking about murder. Um, and I wonder sometimes, you know, if your audience is deceived by the fact that you have these kind of <laughs> talking animals, you know, into thinking that this is just all cute. But I really think there's a lot of, you know, pretty nature red and tooth and claw and, 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 a, and a ruthless quality to a lot of the books. Do you find that your readers get the message? I think they do. I think um, uh, publishing just seeks to categorize you because it's easier to sell. Right. You know, it's, it's like putting a handle on a suitcase. They don't really care what's in the suitcase. And, um, and I don't, they can call me anything they want. I don't much care. As I said, my publisher is very good to me, Bantam, and, uh, and then Ballantyne does the, the uh, fox hunting series. But um, the, the one thing I don't do that I think maybe would put me in that cozy category is that I don't go into a lot of lurid sexual detail and all of that. Which, I mean, it isn't that people don't have affairs. They do. It's just handled with a certain Virginia diffidence, if you, if you will. And um, the murders. You see it. I mean, you see what happens to the bodies, but it isn't sort of lingered over in prurient detail. Like, I don't, I don't know if you read The Dante Club, but it mm -hmm. opens, and it's, it's just, I mean, the detail is almost lascivious. 
you know the so many serial killer books are like that it's one reason I've developed a real aversion for them I think a lot of it is just pornography about women well it's a pornography of death too right I mean this is a culture that denies death I mean we literally want an uncrucified Christ except now with Mel Gibson we've got one right um, but um, so whenever something is squelched as the expression of sexuality was during the end of Victoria's reign you get pornography death is squelched so now you're getting this sort of pornography of death and violence six feet under the family plot if you want to look at it in TV terms it'll always come in the back door one way or the other and, and I don't do that so therefore perhaps I'm seen as cozy I just sort of say what is and get on with it I think I think actually part of the cozy thing is because of the cats um, and the dog you know that those are kind of components in an awful lot of cozy mysteries what was it that inspired you to have a series where the animals talk to each other I think they have elaborate communication skills. I don't think I know. Um, including the prey animals have elaborate communication skills. They have the ability to move their ears and raise their fur and move their tails and uh, throw, literally throw off a scent at will, particularly a fox. And these are, are communicative. They have a vocal range. Um, and in some cases, much wider than our own. So. They haven't developed language, yet they understand it. Um, what is it? The, a seeing eye dog can, uh, rec has a vocabulary of about 300 words. And they know the difference between nouns and verbs. Horses have a much more limited vocabulary, but they understand. And cats, we don't know, because they're rather uncooperative about their language skills. But they haven't actually developed the language. We have. And while it's a wonderful tool, it's also become a shield. Because language isn't life. It's simply a representation to try to get ideas together or people together to get something accomplished. I actually think it began in hunting because that was the first cooperative thing we did as a species. Um, but we are now so blinded by the word that we're missing all other forms of communication. We can't even read our own species anymore. M many humans can't even read another human's body language anymore. So we're getting further and further away from being human instead of more and more human. So is it, is it fun for you to set it up so that the animals can, are talking to the reader and to each other, and yeah. there's that layer going on, and then part of the tension of the book, if you will, part of the suspense is whether the humans will pick up on what the animals have already figured out. It's, it's enormous fun for me, and it's, it's, a, it's a very useful technique. I sort of think of, of Sneaky Pie's books as, um, if any of your viewers are Southerners, there's a, in the summertime, you get a delicacy called Seven Layer Salad. Right. And you, you've had it. I have. You know, and each layer is like, you know, ice cold peas and then cheese, and then you'll get some lettuce or arugula or whatever, and then you'll get maybe some egg, and, but there are layers, so if you cut into it, it's like the earth, you know. You right. See, so I always kind of think of these novels as a seven layer salad. There are some people that will get all seven layers. You know, when they read it, they'll get the whole thing. And there are others that might, they may only get the first two, but they've had a good time. That's and a good point. When you say Southern, um, you were born, what, in Pennsylvania? I was actually born almost on the Mason-Dixon line. I was born in Hanover, Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. My mother was working at uh, Hanover Shoe Farms. It's uh, the largest standard breeding farm in America, uh, in the world, actually. And her <laughs> water broke, and uh, the closest hospital was Hanover, Pennsylvania. So, uh, I, by rights, I'm a Yankee instead of a Marylander, and my father's family was from Virginia. But nobody in the family ever lets me forget this. How fun. So you actually are a Virginian, because I read that you had lived in Florida, grew up in Florida or something, and I was trying to work out Junior high and high school. Okay. Uh, we went down there when it was really pretty primitive. There wasn't air conditioning yet in most of the buildings. And the Miami Herald was the biggest building in Florida. It was six stories high. Uh huh. Do you think of Florida as Southern in the sense that, that you're defining Southern? Yeah, I do. Underneath it all, Florida is more reactionary and backward, I think, than any other set of Southern state, including Mississippi. I actually think Mississippi's fabulous. Um, but underneath Florida, there is something so remote. And also the fact that they never really made peace with the Seminoles. I think that peace treaty was finally signed within the last 20 years. The treatment of the Seminoles, because I saw it. I was right there with it. And then as the wave of 
Yankees came in, the Snowbirds out of w Wisconsin and Michigan and all these places. What I saw, and not all of them, of course, but it made a vivid impression on me because released from their communities and the restraint of cultural control, I mean, in a way, their racism ran riot. 